Thank you. Have a seat. Thank you. God bless you. <clears throat> so, wow, what a morning. I always think, why would I? I don't need to come up here. Let's just. <laughs> Got to say hi to mom. She's listening online. She's a 96-year-old wonderful fellow believer to all of you. So, And hi to the rest of you, wherever you are. <clears throat> I'm going to teach on the cross. This is a pretty trite teaching title. It's been used once or twice, I think. <laughs> but I would like to perhaps come at it from a different perspective with you this morning. Um, and I, you know, if you've listened to me teach once or twice in the past, you know that I, I really can't start a teaching without going to Genesis, right? So, <laughs> But, you know, Garrett was talking about how good God is, and, and the healing of the blind boy, the raising of that child from the dead, the, <clears throat> the many, many miracles and testimonies that we all represent sitting here, and they're not always as dramatic as getting healing of blindness, which is a physical healing. Most of the healing, many of the healings, and in fact, the very first thing that Jesus Christ said he came to do was to heal the brokenhearted, right? So you can't see a broken heart. You can't see it. But they're all over the place. We've all experienced it. So the goodness of God is what compels God in Genesis 1 to create the heavens and the earth. <clears throat> Why did he do this? Why did he create the heavens? Why is there something as opposed to nothing? There doesn't have to be anything here, guys. We don't have to be here. Nothing has to be here. It came from a God who, out of the goodness of his heart, created the heavens and the earth. And the reason I know it was his goodness, because it says it over and over and over again in chapter 1 of Genesis. If you haven't read it, thank you, sir. Go ahead and read it. And you'll see that he keeps saying, oh, and it was good. Oh, and that was good. And he says, oh, you know, you know what I can do? I can do that. Oh, that's good. And then he gets to human beings, and he says, that's, that's very good. And in his creation of heaven and earth, he had a, a desire, a goal that comes, keep in mind, comes from this goodness, right? And its goodness is going to be displayed now in kind of this is the coup de grace. This is the, the peak of his creative energy is going to be a human being, a man and a woman, and he gives them a mission. And he gives him the mission to be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth, and subdue it. But he also calls him his image bearers, made in his image. They are to bear his image into the earth. It's hard for us to grasp this. It's hard for us to understand this because we spend so many times in the mirror looking at someone that we do not see as the image of God. Far, far from it. Too often we look at our physical face or our physical attributes and feel bad about it, or we feel shame for things we've done in the past, or whatever. Doesn't change the truth that out of his goodness, he created human beings to bear his image. Okay, and so this is what Adam and Eve had as a mission in life. And it was to take his goodness and his love and bring it to the entire earth. He gave them dominion over the earth so they could bring him, his goodness, into the earth so that his glory, the knowledge of God, could cover the earth like the water covers the seas. That's what it was about. And then what happened? They fell. They fell. The, the purposes of God focused on these image-bearing human beings now are messed up, and he needs to fix it. He needs to fix that. Now, they, they fell. Eve was deceived, and who, who deceived Eve? Satan. Who was Satan before he was called Satan? Lucifer, archangel, bearer of light. So before man fell, an angel, an archangel, the bearer of God's light, also rebelled and fell. Now you got, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, You've got heaven messed up and earth messed up. Now, you can ponder all day long, all day long, why would God create a heaven and earth and then allow it to get messed up? Go ahead and ponder it. The only thing I can say to you is he gave angels and human beings free will. And if you doubt that, ask yourself, well, how are, how are things going in your life when you, by your own will, do what you want? <laughs> right? You give free will to the created thing, the possibility is they're going to mess it up. 
And they did. But as the good God, the creator of the heavens and the earth, now he is obligated, because he has this kind of covenant relationship with heaven and earth, he is obligated to fix it. And the fix is not just to, oh, you sinned, you know, there's a moral problem, and now you have to be a good person. It's way deeper than that. You know what's happened to the human race? They've lost their vocation, their calling as image-bearing people. He has to fix that now. And so from Genesis 3.15, throughout the Bible, the fix is in Jesus Christ. The whole Bible from Genesis 3.15 is about God fixing it in a guy that we call today Jesus Christ. It says, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. And he's speaking. Guess who God's speaking to right here? Satan. It's like game on. Okay, I see what you did. First you rebelled, threw you to earth, and now you've messed up the human being. So here's, here's what I'm going to tell you, Satan. I am going to put an enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. He, her offspring, is going to bruise or literally crush your head. You're going to bruise his heel. Yeah, you're going to cause some damage. He's going to crush you. This is a promise from the creator of the heaven and earth. And Satan, in all of his evil craziness, knows one thing. God is still God, and he's not. <laughs> this is a problem. And the rest of the Bible is all about this promised seed coming. This is what Jesus Christ is about. And it ends, the whole Bible ends, if you look at Revelation 22, verse 20, it says... He who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming soon. Amen. Come who? Lord Jesus. That's the end of the Bible. So now let's talk. What is the Bible about? It's, an, it's if you know, you know, here's what the Bible is. It's not a holy book of rules and regulations or moral lessons or here's how you can be a good person. Here's what I really want for you to do as far as how you should act. Now, to be sure, there are great moral lessons in the Bible. There's great things to be learned about how we should conduct ourselves. You know, but you know what the, really, what the Bible is? It's God saying, you know what I want you to know? I want you to know it's really real. What, you, what is really real? Because, I mean, we sure need that today, don't we? Because, I mean, you could watch a dozen news feeds, you know, you get a dozen different versions of reality, right? You just, what is really going on here? That's why the Bible was authored by God and why people wrote it. So we know what's really real. And what's really real is the human race got messed up. And there, there was a fix needed. And that fix is in this guy, Jesus Christ. And he's coming back. And when he comes back, then is going to be the culmination of the fix. We're not there. We live in this tension. And here's the problem with being a Christian. Just, there is a problem. It's a now, not yet reality. Right now is our salvation. Today, right now, we are saved. Today, right now, little kids can get healed of blindness and raised from the dead. Today, right now, our hearts can be healed because of Jesus Christ. But we're not there yet, are we? Because the world is still, I think you could all agree on this, a mess. Right? Needs fixing. And so come quickly, Lord, because when he comes back, the final fix is in and a new heavens and a new earth wherein dwells righteousness, and a new heavens and a new earth where we live on an earth and we are now full image-bearing people because we have a new body fashioned like unto Christ's body. And guess what? His glory and his knowledge will cover the earth like the waters cover the seas. And that's where we're heading because God has to fix it. This promised seed... So the seed is a, a human being, right? And we know it's Jesus. But it comes through Abraham first. I mean, basically, the process of our salvation really starts with this guy, Abraham. And he created a, a baby in Sarah's womb. If you know the story, uh, Sarah was unable to have kids her whole life, never had a kid. Abraham, therefore, didn't have any kids. And God's promise to Abraham when he was 75 years old was, you're going to be the father of many nations, not just one kid. You're going to be father of many nations. He says, really? 
Uh, have you met my wife? <laughs> Doesn't look like it's happening. 25 years go by. He is now 100. She's 90. She's not getting any better, and neither is he. When they are fully both unable to have a kid, guess what? Isaac is born. Isaac is the lineage of Abraham and Sarah, and it's in Isaac's seed that the ultimate promise seed of Genesis 3.15 is coming. So you want to know what's going on in the Bible? From like Abraham, which is in Genesis 15, all the way through, till you get to Jesus Christ, it's a battle. <laughs> it's a battle. Because Satan knows he's got to kill that promise. The lineage of the promised seed's got to go away. <laughs> He kills the line, if he kills the line of Abraham, it's over. Game over. You lose, Buckwheat. I win. So the whole by and it gets really tense at times. It's a great movie. You ought to watch it. It really gets tense. I mean, it gets down to just a nitty-gritty, like, oh, my gosh, it's close. We have to try to grasp, though, the motive of God's drive to fulfill this plan. And uh, it, it, we, if we don't go deeper, if we don't understand that the, the engine, the power of his purpose is love. And let's define love. You've heard me say this before, but I won't ask you to repeat it after me. But it is to will the good. Yeah, go ahead and repeat that. To will the good. This is what love is. I know this because this is what Genesis 1 says. God's love was demonstrated in his goodness, his good, 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 very good creation. To love is to will the good. That is the engine that drives him in everything he does. So when we talk about God, when you're invited to get to know God better, when you're invited to give your life to God, when you're invited to, look, stop living your self-willed lives and try to become more and more an obedient son of God, the one you're obeying is compelled and driven. The engine of everything he does cosmically and in your life is for your good. That's it. And we have to grasp that if we're going to really understand this story. The nature of God is to direct his power toward this goodness. And that's why when it says in John 3.16 that God so loved, he so willed the good, for the whole world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him would not perish, but live how long? Forever. It is love that compels that. Now, as I said, his, his salvation plan, starting in Genesis 3.15, was accomplished through Abraham and Sarah, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Israel, promises after promises after promise, many exceeding great and precious promises given to the human race. Israel was, by the way, Israel was not just supposed to be this self-contained little nation. They kind of like to think of themselves that way. But you know what the purpose of Israel was? Was to be a beacon of light to the entire world. It was to be a nation whose God is Jehovah whose God is the creator of heavens and the earth, who could witness by their lives and by his goodness toward them that he gave them this promised land, milk and honey, he, that he had so blessed them that the rest of the world would go, oh, your God has got to be greatest God. And so that the nations would come to Israel. And so that his covenant could ultimately be with the entire human race. And so he had given Israel promise after promise after promise of his goodness. And it says, go to 2 Corinthians 1.20. I love this verse. For all the promises of God find their yes in him, talking about Jesus Christ. That is why it is through him that we utter our amen to God for his glory. Think about this. All the promises of God for thousands of years find their yes in Jesus Christ. This guy was walking on the earth, the living embodiment of God's precious promises, all which had found their yes in him. This was, this was the man, Jesus Christ. He was the full embodiment of God's word 
It says in, in John chapter 1, 14, that it, the Word dwelt, it became flesh, and he was, the, he was the walking yes of God's promises. Hebrews 2, verse 14. Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, that would be us, he himself, Jesus himself, likewise partook of the same things. That through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil. Have you ever asked yourself, why did he have to die? Why did this man, this sinless man, the one who is the yes of all of God's promise, why, why the death? Why did he have to do that? It was the way to destroy the power of death. Because guess what? He got up. So I want you to think about this. The original purposes of God in heaven and earth need fixing. The promise of how the fix is going to be is this guy, Jesus Christ. Thousands of years of a battle between good and evil, trying to take out this line of Abraham and Sarah, and it fails, and this guy, Jesus Christ, is born, and the Word became flesh and tabernacled among us, and we beheld him full of grace and truth as the only begotten of the Father. In him are all the answers to the promises of yes. But also in Jesus Christ, he's called the, the last Adam, is he has to take on the fallenness of the human race. He has to take on the fallenness of of heaven itself, right? I mean, he's battling against a fallen angel, for heaven's sakes. He has to take on all the prophetic promises of how God is going to fix the human race. It's all coming rushing forward to him. And it's all on his shoulders. He is the man who's going to fix what the first Adam failed to do, and he's going to do it in a corrupt world. All of this was laid on the, on the shoulders of Jesus Christ. And when we talk about the events of this week coming up, one of the most poignant and pivotal events you'll read about in the Gospels is when he's in the Garden of Gethsemane. This is after the Last Supper, you know, this is after, you know, he knows he's going to be betrayed. This is right before that betrayal is going to be executed. He knows he's going to be taken. Everything I just talked about, he knows this history. He is well aware of this is it. This is it. This is the moment. I'm about to begin the last chapter here of the salvation of the human race, the purposes of God when he said, let there be, let there be light. It's all coming down to this moment. And rushing through history then are all those things historically that happened. All the believers, all the people who believed God and brought it to this moment, it's, all, it's in this moment in, in Gethsemane. But also rushing there is the rulers of the darkness of the world. Rushing to that moment to take him out. And it's why he was on his hands and his feet and his knees and in his hands and he was, he was bent over and it says he was sweating as it were like great drops of blood and three times, three times Jesus Christ said, Father, is there, is there any other way? Because he knew, he knew what the rulers of darkness could do to a human being. And he knew that he was about to go through the worst that they could possibly meet out. And he said, is there any other way? Three times. But he's three times said, nevertheless, not my will, your will be done. And he got up <clears throat> and he walked boldly with his men and said, I'm the man. I know you're looking for me. I'm that guy. This is, uh, I mean, you have to kind of think about the scriptures here a little bit, to try to appreciate the immensity of this and the importance of it to us today. But I want you to think about something. Have you ever thought about, if you look at historically, when were things written in what we call the New Testament? 
What were the first things written that believers like us got access to? Where we could hear like, okay, tell me about this guy, Jesus Christ. What were those first things? They were letters written by whom? Paul. So you can go to your Bible right now, and yes, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are before the letters written by Paul, but chronologically, they were after. Do you know that those Gospels were written toward the end of the first century? So now hundreds and thousands of people have converted to Christianity. From Israel, even Gentiles have been converted. Why would God then have these letters, or these, yeah, these letters from you know, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John written after the fact? We always read them before. Why would they come after? Why do you suppose that is? Because, it, you know what? People had witnessed these events in Jerusalem that Garrett talked about. These events that, are gonna, that we can think about this week, and I encourage, people were there, and they witnessed it. There were over 500 people who saw the resurrected Jesus Christ. They knew he had gotten up. They were aware of it. And some of these people had been put to death. You don't die for a lie, do you? You don't die for something that's some sort of a you know, conspiracy to make up a, a myth. Who's going to die for a myth? They died because they couldn't deny it. I, I was there. I saw what happened. I saw the events in Jerusalem. I saw everything that happened, and I saw them get up. But guess what? By the end of the first century, a lot of those people aren't around. They, didn't, they weren't there. So guess what? Four different guys were inspired by God to write an account about Jesus Christ. And if you look at the weight of those Gospels, like what's it really about? Most of it is about this last week we are about to go into. Because it's so important for us to understand that all of history rushed to this time. To this time. And it wasn't just the history of God's promises, which were yes in Jesus Christ. It was the history of evil rushing to this very point in time. Now think about it. This is, and this is what God says is really real. Okay, You can read history about a lot of things. And a lot of stuff happened out there. And to be honest with you, if you looked at the volume of other things you could read about in history that were contemporary with what God was doing in Israel, God was doing in Jesus Christ, that volume, oh, way outweighs. But it doesn't matter. Because that's not what was really, really going on. What was really going on is what God says in his scriptures in accordance with his scriptures. That's why we read them, guys. We read the Bible not to be good people. We read the Bible so we know what is really going on here. The four Gospels, I, the book of John really captures the sweep of this history. Because how does John start out his, his book, his letter? In the beginning. I like John. He went back to Genesis. That's what you're supposed to do. In the beginning. And instead of saying, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, what does he say? In the beginning was the what? Word. The word. The word logos. It's the purpose. It's the plans. The heart. The desires that God has. That's what was in the beginning. And, of course, that was with God. Of course, God's heart was with God. But it's trying to say, look, he had a plan. He had a purpose. It was for us to be image-bearing people. It was for the earth to be filled with his glory and his knowledge. It was, be, it was a plan, a, 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 you know, a, a vision for how good things were going to be. This is the logos that he had in his heart. And that logos, it says in John 1.14, became flesh and dwelt among us. Isn't that amazing? But that same book of John gets to Palm Sunday. And it's right after Lazarus, you know, Lazarus was raised from the dead. Jesus goes back to Bethany where he raised Lazarus from the dead. People hear about it. They heard about, this is the guy that raised Lazarus from the dead. He's coming to Jerusalem. He's coming, you know, wow, let's go. You know, and a lot of people believed he was the king, the Messiah, and that he was going to come. And like David, he was going to slay the Romans, and he was going to set up the kingdom. And the temple, once again, would be the place where the Shekinah glory of God would show up. And this is what's going to happen. And so, yeah, let's, let's game on. Let's do it. And so Jesus Christ comes in on this triumphal entry, and within 24 hours or so after that, he's betrayed and he's in the hands of the Romans. I think they were a little off in what God was actually having to do here. It was far more required than Jesus becoming a political or military leader, for heaven's sakes. He had to take on all of history. 
and he had to fix it. And he says in in John chapter 13, verse 1, Before he, let, me, let me share this with you. Before he says in John chapter 12, he said, Now is my soul troubled. Why is his soul troubled? He's being exalted. Hosanna, Hosanna. Why is he troubled? Because he knows what's coming. He says, What shall I say? Shall I say, Father, save me from this hour? But he says, But for this purpose I have come to this hour. Now is the judgment of the world. Now will the ruler of the world be cast out. He sees what's coming. Isn't that awesome? I mean, he's like, I'm getting ready. (laughs) This is what's happening here. John chapter 13, 1 through 5, it says, Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. I want you to really... Think about it. He loved them to the end. This is John 13. There's a lot more chapters left in John. The rest of those chapters is how he loved them to the end. Next verse. During supper, when the devil had already put it in the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things... <laughs> Here's all things into your hands, by the way. Have a good day. And that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper. He laid aside his outer garments and taken a towel, tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wrap them with a towel that was wrapped around them, wrapped around him. Hard for us to understand this culturally. We can't. We can't begin with, to understand how the act of humility that Jesus portrayed here is, is beyond our ability to understand because it's just a different culture than ours. But trust me, they were freaking out when he did that. And you remember Peter said, oh, Lord, you can't wash my feet. Are you kidding me? I'm not going to let you, the Messiah, wash my feet. Well, then, you know, you don't have anything to do with me. Oh, well, then wash my whole body, Lord, you know. This is, this is an incredible act of humility, and it really, in my mind, it reflects the humility that it says when it's in Philippians 2.8 which is a phenomenal poem about Jesus Christ. And it says that he humbled himself and he took on the form of a servant and became obedient unto death, even death on a cross. Now, why does it say that? Even death on a cross. I'll tell you why it says it. Because there was no more horrible way to die than on a cross. You couldn't, it, was, it was dreamt up by evil people pushed around by the rulers of darkness of this world to portray the most painful, the, most, the worst infliction of punishment you could put on a human body. And it was all designed to show the world who saw the crucified one to say, we are so powerful, look what we can do to a human being. And we can do it to you. It was, it was designed for that. The cross was so wicked, was so evil, that in polite society, you wouldn't talk about it. There, there were, there's literature of this age where it's, these aren't even believers. They're just Roman citizens. So you don't talk about the cross at parties. That's just impolite because people, because they've seen it. And it's like, it's, it's horrible. You don't even want to go there. Even the death of the cross, it says, so from this time in John 13, through the Gospel of John, you can read it, but the events are all rushing to this point. And it's rushing, uh, you know, and, and it's like I said, imagine this now. I want you to think about this, if you can grasp this, that all of history is rushing to this point. He's going to go to this cross, the worst kind of death. Before that, he is beat. You know, as Garrett said, he's, he's captured. I know that this chronology might be different from what you learn in the church, but biblically I can tell you it's very clear in Scripture. He was captured on what we would call Monday night. He was beat from Monday night until Wednesday morning when they let him out and put him on a cross. Wednesday, 
he is standing with Pilate, and they've, they've driven a crown of thorns into his scalp. These aren't just little thorns. These are, he's driven this into his scalp. They put a purple robe on him, mocking him. Oh, you said you were the king. Okay, let's put a purple robe on the guy. Yeah, here's your king. Beat him to death. I won't even go into the horrible, excruciating things that were, you know, that were done to him by these Roman soldiers who are just picked because they, they, they enjoy it. Right, And here he is, and Pilate leads him out. Think about this. Here is the last Adam. Here is the man, the Word of God made flesh. The one who so bore the image of, man, of God, so bore it so well, that if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Think about this. This man, and talk about, you know, so what do you think the devil wants to do to this guy? Oh, Hate him. Bearing God's image like that, being so effective to show God's love, his power, his ability, his desire, his goodness for the world. I know what I want to do with that. I want to beat it. And he did. He did. It says in Isaiah that the face of Jesus Christ was beaten so badly you couldn't, it was unrecognizable. More than any other person has ever been beat. Now think about this. Pilate brings him out, and what does he say? Behold, the man. This is, to me, a supreme moment. The devil is like, yeah, here's your, here's your image-bearing human. I did it to the first Adam, and look what I've done to the last. Behold, the man. And he just, from an outsider looking at it, it it's over. It's over. And if there was any doubt about it, they put him on a cross. Nobody gets off a cross alive ever and he's on the cross and what's interesting jesus knowing his hour has come knowing that history has rushed forward as well as the history of the rulers of the darkness of the world and it's all here as he's hanging on the cross it's all here it's all this is what it is knowing this and knowing there's people around who are watching us What's the first, one of the first things he says on the cross? My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Now, God, there's been a thousand, a million sermons taught on that. Like, oh, God had forsook Jesus Christ because he became sin, and God hates sin, and so God left. And Jesus is like, oh, you went away, Father. You, you can't, it's not scriptural. He is quoting from Psalm 22, verse 1, which is a psalm about the Messiah. If I had time, I'd read you the psalm. It chronicles... What happens when he's on the cross? It talks about him, you know, dividing his, his clothes and mocking him and, you know, handing him a, a sponge with vinegar and hyssop, all of which happened in the gospel accounts. It's, it's like he's saying, okay, I get it. You feel like God has left you because you're looking at me and I'm on a cross and I was your savior. And you're thinking, God, you've You've left. And he quotes Psalm 22, verse 1. And guess what? He gets to the end. And what's the, what does he say at the end? What's his last words? Which is also the end of Psalm 22. He quotes it. What's finished? <laughs> what's finished? I'll tell you what's finished. Evil. The rulers of darkness have been extinguished by what? Love. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Jesus, loving them, loved them to the end. This is the end. It is finished. It is love demonstrated in goodness that extinguishes evil. And right now, it still works, by the way. This is why when we, we gather, we encourage each other to the worthy endeavor of love. To love yourself because God so loved you. To love others as you love yourself. This isn't a warm and fuzzy feeling we're, we're striving for here, guys. It is to will the good because it is the good that extinguishes the evil. It is, it is goodness that quenches the fiery darts of the wicked one. We encourage each other to will the good. 
And to will the good means I take my will, my heart, my energies, my desires, my purposes, everything that I have, and I direct it to that. And by doing that, guess what? I unleash then through the Spirit of Christ in me. Now it's like, okay, now I'm in alignment. Aligned Ministries is about getting aligned with that so that his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. To will the good on earth as he wills it in heaven is our, that's our mission, because we're image bearers. To bring his image into the world. We do it with our will. And this is what happened at the cross. It gave us this shot. It's what he finished. He finished the plan of redemption. He finished the fix. He put a stake in the ground, and he said, it's, it's, it's over here. This whole, this whole train wreck, I just, I'm fixing it right here, right now. And I, you know how we know it worked? How do we know? He was resurrected from the dead. That's how we know. God resurrected him from the dead. How do we know that death was conquered? How do we know that we, we who have all our lifetimes been subject to the bondage of death are no longer under that bondage? Because he was raised from the dead. And Jesus Christ knew that he had fulfilled and he had carried the burden of all history and he had loved in the face of the most evil you can imagine. And therefore, it is finished. And it's finished for us. And it's, that's why it says in Romans 5, it says, By one man's disobedience, death entered into the world. But by one man's obedience, we can reign in life. By whom? One, Jesus Christ. And it says, Paul says in Galatians 2, he said, The life I now live in my flesh right now. This is what I mean. Now is the day of salvation, right now. Yes, we're waiting for the completion. Man, we can't wait for that to come, right? When the whole earth is filled with his glory and we are purified of anything that's not pure, that day's coming. But right now is the day of salvation. Right now, we can live this life in the flesh, it says, by the faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Amen? Amen. Okay, thank you.